Hello and welcome. My name is Peter Martin. I'm the Business and Economy Editor at The Conversation. I'm a visiting fellow at the ANU's Crawford School of Public Policy as well and a distinguished alumni of Flinders University in South Australia. It's something that means a lot to me, although the term distinguished might not have been applied to me by my teachers at the time. I'm on the lands of the Ghana people in the Adelaide Plains. Um, our guest, Julie Toth, is on the lands of the Kulin Nation in what we now call Melbourne. And John Hawkins is on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in Canberra, which is itself derived from a Ngunnawal word. I want to pay my respects to the elders of these lands on which we're conducting this conversation, past, present and emerging. This is a live stream and we want you to butt in, starting now if you like, with questions. The more, the sooner the better. Uh, use the chat function. Ask conversation leaders, readers a question and 10,000 will respond. We asked you, conversation readers, to name the three topics that would most influence your vote in the election. Number one was climate change, which is also, by the way, what came up when we surveyed uh, economists with the Economic Society. Number two was the environment. Uh, one third picked that, two thirds picked climate change. Coming in at number three, picked by 19.9%, .9%, 20% of you, one in five, was the cost of living, which is sort of on a par with um, uh, you know, its prominence, uh, number two, in the uh, ABC Vote Compass survey. And those results, that interest was before the news about inflation last week, 5.1%, before interest rates began climbing this week. It started at uh, a quarter of a percentage point on your mortgage or whatever, but um, we've no idea where it will end. Joining us is Julie Toth, at present at NAUS Group, and before that, for nine years, Chief Economist at the Australian Industry Group, where she gained an extraordinary insight into these things, and uh, earlier, Senior Economist at the ANZ Bank, where she dealt with these kind of statistics every month. She's at present affiliated with Swinburne University. Also joining us is Canberra University's John Hawkins, previously with the Reserve Bank, and the Treasury, as well as the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and importantly, and that was fascinatingly for John, Secretary to the Senate Economics Committee. As I said, in the words of uh, Dean Martin, for those of you who are old enough to remember, keep those cards and letters coming in, keep the questions coming in. First, Julie, we're hearing that everything is going up except wages. It's almost a mantra. Is that right or, or um, essentially right? Yeah, that's a, a really good question, Peter. And the latest uh, data that we have from the ABS on the Consumer Price Index does in fact indicate that just about every category included in that basket has gone up. And I think 77 out of 87 correct. categories, which and, is the most and, ever. Exactly. And, and that's really unusual. And it, it underscores the range of factors that are contributing to price rises at the moment. Um, we're pretty much getting hit from every source you can think of. We've got the geopolitical considerations that are affecting commodity prices. We've got the local um, floods and, uh, you know, previously fire damage, which actually is still having an effect on agricultural output and supply in, in some locations. And of course, we've got the COVID disruptions um, that have affected supply chains um, coming in and out of Australia and movement of goods around Australia. We've got a capacity crunch across several key sectors, most notably construction. Um, and we've also got um, a couple of factors that have come out of um, fiscal policy nationally and with the states. Um, where some of those those policies have in fact contributed to price rises, unfortunately, what do you and mean? most probably unintendedly. So, for example, the the home builder scheme that um, heavily promoted uh, renovations and home building um, through 2021 that that brought forward a lot of construction activity, but it was at a time where capacity was constrained. 
And we, we are already seeing the, you know, the, the results of that with very long delays, but also price increases across the board for, for building products and for getting things done. It's, so it's, it's almost a, a perfect storm and quite unusual. It is. And, and I think um, what makes it tricky for households to navigate is uh, in the past where when we've seen, say, one or two um, product categories rise in price, you can substitute out of them. So, you know, that's most notably in, in food and groceries, for example, where um, in the past we've had spikes of banana prices. So that means people buy another sort of fruit instead. Yeah, it it, it actually meant everything. It meant then that the banana um, the consumer price index was not accurate because it showed that banana prices, people who spend a certain portion of their, their fruit budget on bananas, were racing up. But in fact, bananas are so substitutable, for, virtually no one was paying those. But that was then. It's different now, you're saying. Yeah, and some, some products are more substitutable than others, of course. So, you know, petrol's the most obvious example for most households. If you've got a petrol car, you can't put something else in it. And you need to get around. Uh, other things that fall into that category are um, rents. So the housing category in the CPI, um, the bulk of that reflects rental increases. And again, it's very difficult to substitute or avoid that. Well, to you, John Hawkins, one way of categorising this, a simple way of categorising it, is to say these are price increases that interest rates, that even cutting back on our spending uh, to a large degree, can do nothing about. And perhaps even the Reserve Bank you used to work for shouldn't be pushing up prices. Um, now, no simple categorisation is right, but... Uh, uh, how is, is is that right to a large degree and, and how is it wrong? Well, the Reserve Bank's aiming at um, an inflation rate for the average of the prices of everything. So if it can make the price of the things that it can influence grow, grow less, and even if other things are growing faster, it can try to keep the average inflation rate around the 2 to 3% target band. Right. So will... It seems to me that now home building prices are to some extent an exception because it's a, a fixed amount of labour and a, a big demand for home building. But it seems to me, am I right, that on almost everything else, um, pushing up interest rates to sort of impoverish Australians a bit, that's the point of it, um, won't make much difference. Also, also a higher interest rate other things equal should make the exchange rate a bit stronger and that should make import uh, prices uh, lower. So that that mechanism should still work. Well, except it might not, given that the US has <laughs> overnight put up its its cash rate by uh, double what we have. <laughs> yeah, but if we didn't move at all... Uh, That's right. In fact, it'd be great. Yeah, the, the interest rate differential is quite important for Australia's exchange rate. Um, you know, there, there's lots of models of the Aussie dollar out there, but the most reliable predictors are the, the interest rate differential between Australia and US, uh, followed by commodity prices. Um, now they're often working in different directions. So even just with those two, it gets quite complex. But as John said, you know, if, if we didn't follow the US, then that gap would get bigger and our dollar would be even lower, which actually adds to inflation even more. So and, it, and it's, the, it's the still The way works. that works, do, 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 do I have this right? The, the way that works is uh, if uh, we put up interest rates, more foreigners bring money into the country because they, they think it's a, uh, they've got uh, better returns on their investments. That pushes up the price of the dollar you know, all other things being equal, pushes it up relative to what it would have been. And that makes everything just that little bit more, that comes from overseas, just that little bit more affordable. Yes, that's right. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's sort of um, self-correcting thing. Now, we've, we have a question from Tracy Davis. Thank you. Um, how quickly do you think... That Well, I suppose this is actually a broader question is what can we do or what could an incoming government do about wages to help them uh, 
you know, at least catch up. So standard of living wasn't falling. Her specific question, I'll ask you first, mm -hmm. uh, John, the, 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 then Julie, how quickly do you think a Labor government could kickstart wage rises, bigger wage rises, by actually paying its public servants more? Is, 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 that, a, is that a response and is it likely? Uh, John first. Well, they could do that sort of as quickly as they want, I, I guess, as far as the federal public servants are concerned. Of course, a lot of public servants are, are state uh, public servants, so the federal government has sort of no say uh, about that. Um, but they might wait until the next scheduled sort of uh, negotiations on their contracts, so they'll, that will spread it out a bit. Also, um, you, you're talking about fair um, pay rises, so uh, there's annual minimum uh, wage case cases that are run, are run by the Fair Work Commission. Uh, so there's, again, a delay in, in that uh, happening. I can't hear you, Peter. Uh, sorry about that. The, the the good thing in this country, I suppose, is that the uh, Fair Work Commission nearly always pays wage rises in accordance with inflation. So at least, um, yeah, sure, there's a delay, but uh, I, I suppose there's that guarantee. Julie, Julie what, what do you think yeah. can be done to increase wage, increase wa increase wage increases? It might be worth just um, clarifying the relationship between the Fair Work Commission and the government because uh, the Fair Work Commission is independent and it only uh, changes the minimum wage once a year. That does have a big impact though because so many of the, even though uh, you know only a small proportion of the workforce uh, are paid exactly the minimum wage, a much larger number have got a work under awards or contracts that are linked to uh, minimum pay decisions. So it does have quite a big ripple on effect, even for workers that are on substantially higher rates than the minimum wage. Um, as you said, the, the Fair Work Commission has traditionally looked at a, an inflation plus a margin model for adjusting the minimum wage each year and those consultations are underway at the moment. The Australian government does in fact participate in those hearings and it does pre present evidence each year at the minimum wage hearings. Uh, it's normally done through, through Treasury boffins coming along to the hearings and presenting the latest data and information. Um, that has traditionally been an apolitical exercise, but that's not to say that the, the model for that might not change in the future. There's also What's ability oh. for government to adjust awards for particular industries and occupations. So we can see that, for example, at the moment in the debate that's going on about um, award rates for aged care workers, for example. Well, in fact, both parties will be up for there's a fair value, work value case at the moment. And both parties, mm. uh, despite the, the differences in presentation, both parties will pay, will have to pay, uh, because the government is the, the employer of aged uh, care staff in the sense that it, uh, it, it funds the people who pay them. Correct. Uh, we'll so as well as the minimum wage, they, they can adjust wage rates across the award system. What was it like? Because you, you at the Australian Industry Group mm. would have been part of that process. Like it's, yes. I've only just looked at the documentation and it's massive. Look, it's, it's a little bit like a wage version of the interest rate that we've just been discussing. Um, the, the RBA's got the one rate, right? The, the cash rate that it can adjust and it, it is often regarded <laughs> as a bit of a sledgehammer approach. It's all or nothing. The minimum wage is, is a similar instrument in that it's a single rate that is set across the country um, and it applies to everyone. And, and as I said, it's there are so many um, flow-ons to it that um, even though it's just that single number, it packs a big punch when it changes. We have a question from John Haggerty, uh, which uh, I'll uh, put to you, John. And it's, if the government... Uh, get, obtains and, and gives big wage increases, what will that have <laughs> on further increasing inflation? Uh, will it, um, he asks, will it cut the intended benefit? 
And I suppose the related question is, you know, is there a risk if we, um, okay, so the published inflation rate at the moment is 5.1%. If employers give people 5% pay increases, in the words of Kylie Minogue, you know, we should be so lucky. But if they if they did, will that just accelerate price rises further because employers will have to pay them? Do you first, John, and then Shirley? Uh, yeah, there is a is a risk that you can get a wage price spiral uh, taking off, and that's why the Reserve Bank is acting to try to get the inflation rate down before um, numbers like five percent become established as people's idea of what inflation. And before the next be. wage case, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, Julie, is, is that a is that a? a... <laughs> is it, that it, is sort of risk? It, it is a risk, but it's that's assuming that all of it flows through. So if you think about a, a typical sort of small to medium business that it needs to pay these rises, and, you know, we could be cheeky and, and point out that, you know, compliance is a problem in some industries. So let's just be nice and assume that they do pay these increases when they're meant to, when they're when they're all of these increases um, are factored in, there's a variety of ways that a typical business can um, cover that additional cost. So they can they can put their prices up, they can find cost savings elsewhere in their business, um, and that's actually a good one because it often means a productivity saving. So they can find a more efficient way of doing something or they can cut um, some input costs, maybe get rid of some waste. Um, or the other nasty one is they can cut the quantity of labour. So they're paying more per hour. They cover that by reducing the number of hours that they're paying for. So this is why we need to be a little bit careful with, with the, um, the wage rises, and particularly at the low end of the market, that we're not looking at a trade-off between um, the, the wage rate and the unemployment rate. Because if businesses respond by uh, cutting the quantity of labour, that results in an increase in underemployment and unemployment. And that's why the Fair Work Commission um, goes to such great lengths to, um, to get that balance right when it's looking at the minimum wage increases each year. Zooming out, uh, John, is there a, it's a simple way of looking at it to say, look, the rest of the world has pushed up these costs largely. The rest of the world has cut our standard of living. There is nothing much that we can do about it. Uh, yes, we can uh, increase wages, but that will increase costs and increase prices. It's something we have to wear. Well, that's that's true of the the, the petrol price. That's definitely been imposed on us by You'd the... You'd add wheat and fertiliser and, and uh, goods with yeah. computer chips in them and things like that. But there's a lot of things that have um, been going up in price faster that it's hard to see as much to do with the rest of the world. So. Uh, for example, that the the health component of the CPI went up by three and a half percent. Housing went up by over six uh, percent. Uh, education by almost five percent. So no, none of those, I, I think, we can uh, blame on what's happening overseas. So there's there is certainly a an increase in domestic cost pressures uh, as well as as the imported factors. There's a question here from Lee Constable. How big a factor? in price rises is to slow down in migration. It would stand to reason that um, without enough workers, uh, one way or another, it's, you either can't make as many things, can't provide as good a service in cafes or whatever, or uh, you're going to have to charge more uh, to attract workers. And, and uh, I suppose we can broaden out more generally. Uh, yeah. to, to, we might as well start with you first, Julie. What has the impact been of virtually zero migration, uh, uh, well, negative uh, migration uh, in net terms, and uh, close to zero population growth on uh, prices and I, I suppose on employment as oh, well. Yeah, that, that's a really complex one because we can think about population numbers in terms of you know the, the supply of labour but also the demand for those services. But the other thing that's, that's happened through the pandemic is um, a massive reduction in mobility for everyone. Um, and that, that's played havoc with supply chains. So the population has declined, but it's also become much more difficult to move people around to where we need them. 
Um, and, and both of those factors have, have um, played into the, the pricing. So um, let's see, when we look at, say, re recreation and culture, which includes, you know, cafes, restaurants, um, the types of businesses that have been really hit hard by the, um, you know, the... I was going to say reduction, but down to almost zero for students and backpackers who typically work in those industries. Um, for them, that, that's that been a big factor. But for other industries like, say, construction, it's more been about the the reduced mobility um, and the, the, the transport um, disruptions that have happened. So it does get quite complex. There's there's another uh, point that um, Saul Leslie, who used to work with you at the um, ANZ, makes, which mm. is hard to believe uh, on the face of it, that uh, closed borders have boosted spending by the Australians in Australia. So uh, yeah. his of the view, his stats show so, this. Yeah, that's correct. The, the easiest way of thinking about this, um, it's a pity we haven't got graphs today, you know, what's, yeah. a, what's an economics discussion? Well, draw, 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 I can try and draw a graph with my hands. Um, Australia's got what's best um, described as a, a tourism spending deficit, a massive one. Um, before COVID closed our borders, um, starting from about sort of 2005, 2006 onwards, um, Australia in aggregate spent far more on international travel, international tourism um, outbound than the inbound flow. All of that stopped. So we're now benefiting from that money that we used to spend overseas. Um, and that actually worries me a little bit when we look at the recovery scenarios because it's, it seems to be all assumed that we're going to be spending a lot locally. But if you look at the historical pattern of what Australians like to do before COVID, um, they much preferred to go shopping in Bali than they did in Byron Bay or Brunswick or, or Parramatta. Um, and, and, you know, that outflow of, of consumer spending will start to creep up again. We might even get a spike, you know, people I... are... Stop. Oh, look, it, 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 it certainly will be big. And also at the risk of uh, denigrating Australia, Australia has the kind of attractions that many people haven't seen and would like to see once. Um, and they probably just have. Um, it, I should point out uh, that question was from Ari Sharp, not the Council. Uh, hi, Thank Ari. You. Um, uh, and uh, John, what, how do you characterise? the effects of this, uh, I suppose, unprecedented near zero population growth and, uh, you know, uh, certainly zero or, or, or negative uh, net migration. Yeah, I mean, I agree with uh, Julie. There's probably a lot of pent-up demand for overseas travel uh, that might be uh, realised uh, now that the borders have opened up. I mean, at the university, for example, we think we got a few more local students in the last couple of years because students who would have gone on a gap year backpacking around Europe you know, came to university again instead. So there's a question, though, with the borders open, are they, are they going to take their gap year between the second and third year at university mm. or something? Um, so, what was your other uh, question? Oh, just 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 to the 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 effect of closed borders. Anyway, I I, I suppose th th there are two offsetting effects. One is you don't have as many people here, pushing up prices. Um, the other is Australians uh, uh, can't spend overseas, and those the other is you, you don't have people to meet the demand. That, that is. Um, you don't have people, so so uh, firms need to either reduce their hours or uh, pay their staff more to, to attract them and, and charge more. Um, and then the, then there's the 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 view. I mean, I, I think this is overstated, but it's, it's widely held that uh, the the main reason we have a low unemployment rate is because we don't have uh, workers and temporary workers uh, from overseas uh, to fill those jobs. I think most studies on the economic effects of, of migration say that it adds more or less the same to uh, demand and supply. So that I'm wondering if that's true in the short term, important. though. I think I think that's definitely um, you know has to be the the case long term. But maybe the unemployment rate has been driven down, and maybe prices have been driven up just by what's happened immediately. You know. 
Yeah, well, it's I mean, it's something we haven't seen for uh, over a century in Australia, uh, the no net uh, migration. So there's not a, uh, a lot of data on which to assess that, I guess. It could, could, could be the case. We have yeah, a question I, from, I think we've yeah, been through such an unusual uh, event and it is still playing out that I don't know that we should draw too many conclusions from, um, you know, the, the, the short term immediate effects um, because, the, the, you know, this has been a, a total shock to the economy and it's been going on for a couple of years now and, and it, it is genuinely unprecedented. So uh, it's difficult to draw those conclusions from this single event. A question from Avis Williamson. Does the Reserve Bank have the right tools? Well, I suppose tool, really, <laughs> to control inflation. Or should it do other things? Or should the government do other things? Now, on the face of it, the government, it was open to the government, John, to do the opposite to what it did. If it really wanted uh, to restrain spending a bit, which is, it didn't, uh, because it handed out money, but uh, handed out, you know, checks of $250 and uh, cut the petrol tax for a while. Um, but, um, you know, if, if we think that in order to restrain prices, the Reserve Bank needs to impoverish people a bit by putting up interest rates a bit, uh, should other tools be used? Should the government be, um, be uh, heaven forbid, uh, taxing more or, or spending less? Um, in order to do that? Or is there something else the Reserve Bank can do? Is there is there another tool or tools uh, available to us that we're, that we're not really using? Well, economists generally talk about monetary policy and fiscal policy as being the two main fiscal ways. Fiscal being government that. spending and taxing. Monetary yeah. so being monetary, monetary policy is the Reserve Bank putting up interest rates. And that's, I mean, they can do a bit in terms of whether the, how many government bonds they buy, but primarily their tool is is interest rates. And that's the same all around the world. That's the way monetary policy works you know, in most countries. Then the other is fiscal policy, which, as you say, is what the government does with the, the budget. So what they do with government spending and what they do with uh, taxes. So if they want to reduce inflationary pressures, then they'd have a, a tighter fiscal policy. In other words, they'd, they'd spend less and they'd, they'd tax more. And as you so say... No, it, it, it's like, it's like having your, your, your foot on the accelerator and your foot on the brake, the Reserve Bank's foot on the brake, the government's <laughs> foot on the accelerator. Yeah, well, <laughs> is, is yeah, a, a lot case? of people said that the uh, budget was more responding to political and economic um, uh, aspects, and I think there's uh, a bit to be said for that argument. I, I suppose it's the reason that we've got this, um, this sort of uh, divergent um, approach and maybe it's been set up this way to to really assist po politicians and decision making. The politicians can blame the Reserve Bank by saying it's impoverishing you a bit, but it's independent. Yeah, bear in mind that that we have got um, interest rates at uh, you know historically low levels at the moment, abnormal abnormally low, um, and they have been for a while. And to some extent. We've got used to these extremely low um, interest rate settings, um, but if you look at the, the historical averages, they're, they're certainly not anywhere near um, what the Reserve Bank or, or most economists would regard as, as a normal range for, for interest rate settings. So the RBI does need to move back to um, that range at some point. Um, just to throw a, a little extra in the works in response to that question about other levers, at the micro, very micro end, and this is really sort of tinkering around the margins, the other place that uh, government can assist with inflation is in a, a range of um, what we call administered pricing, which is government um, government goods and services or government administered goods and services where they do actually have con direct control over the pricing. So some examples of that are things like um, toll roads and public transport prices that typically are indexed to inflation each year. Um, so that's usually within the remit of state government and it's often built into the service contracts with the providers of those services. So they'll typically have a, a contract where they um, they will increase the, the price of a, a 
train ticket or the the toll on the on the freeway by inflation or um, a, a set amount, whatever is greater. So those prices um, can be changed. Other examples uh, that affect inflation are things like childcare subsidies, um, education fees, particularly at the higher education level, um, and some of the, the hospital charges, pharmaceutical prices, all of these things are uh, price regulated. You're almost saying that the best way to reduce prices is to reduce prices, which the government can do for a lot. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that for a discrete portion of, yeah, of yeah. what's in it, the CPI it, basket, there is more control than we give them, are giving them credit for. And also for a lot of wages. The best way to increase wages is to increase wages, given that <laughs> governments are employers. So, uh, But we've sort of got used to the idea that um, that these things are... Uh, are done at arm's length. Just, I was just going to ask you, Julie, bef before that, again, drawing on your experience, you're talking about how interest rates are you know, unbelievably low. I mean, the cash rate is clearly negative in real terms because it's uh, so far below the 5% rate of inflation, it's not funny. Um, those low rates, um, the Australian Industry Group has lots of members who uh, have the opportunity to invest and borrow. Mm. I'm wondering the extent to which low rates do encourage businesses to invest or whether it's a bit like leading a horse to water. You can, you can lower the cost yeah. of investing, but it doesn't make much difference. Yeah, I, look, this is a, a hot topic across um, economics, not just in Australia, but globally, because business investment rates have been extremely low and that feeds into uh, problems with, with pushing up productivity. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that it's the cost of capital that's the barrier. Mm. Um, and, you know, if, if that's not the reason why businesses are, are failing to invest and failing to grow, um, then we do need to look at, at other levers. Um, in, in my experience, the, the cost of capital is one factor, but it's certainly not the only one. Um, when you invest, you still need to get a rate of return. You need to get um, the, you know, the basic reason for the investment um, flowing through your business. So even if the capital is cheap or almost free, uh, you, you still need to have a reason to invest and a reason to grow. And if the businesses are not seeing that, either in the return on the investment or in the potential for growth, then it, it's difficult to get things moving. Um, that, that's why sorry, they've, they've done the, uh, you know, R&D um, yeah. carryovers and uh, there's been a lot of work in that space to encourage business investment in addition to cash rate uh, and, and we're still seeing relatively low rates. Yeah. It's as if business makes its decisions on the basis of whether or not the investment is needed. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, there's, there's, to put it, it, there's more to it than just the cost of credit. That's that's it. John, we have a question from Tracy Davis. Uh, I know you'll love this one. Um, <laughs> do we have a low unemployment rate because the government has changed the definition for being unemployed? <laughs> This is a this is a very very common concern that uh, that we can't believe the figures because the figures have been changed. Uh, no, the been, definition been has been. No some people go so far as to say there's political interference, but uh, with that or not, uh, there, there's a very common view that, uh, and the definition has been uh, modified a few times. John. Yeah, there hasn't been any change to the definition for uh, quite a long time, and it's the same definition that's used in most uh, comparable overseas uh, countries. Now, some people don't like the definition because if you work you know, as little as one hour a week, you're counted as being employed, not unemployed. But um, there's all the ABS also produces data on underemployment. So people who are, are working a few hours, but not as many hours as they want, but the underemployment rate has also come down uh, recently. What would you say to, to, to Tracy Davison? And what would you say, Julie? Because these are mm. very widely held views. And I think mm. they're held partly because people's experience, lots of people's experience, 
tends not to be that of what the figures say, which is record yeah. low unemployment. Tracy, the, um, the the unemployment rate is a statistical definition, so it, it's one of many measures. As John said, there's also the underemployment rate, there's the participation rate, uh, and and then um, there's the uh, just total, you know, population measures as well, and and all of those are showing different things. Um, there is quite a lot of data on the number of hours that that people work, and actually the proportion of the workforce that are working, you know, one one to ten hours a week, for example, is minimal. It's absolutely tiny. Um, all of it is based on uh, labour force surveys that are conducted every month. So what they're asking people is is what they were doing in that survey week. Um, these are different numbers from what you see in the um, the social security data. So if you look at the number of people that are listed as unemployed in the labour force survey, that's not the same number as the people that are receiving unemployment benefits. And at the moment, the number of people receiving unemployment benefits is significantly higher than those that are um, showing up as unemployed in the labour force survey, so to some extent, it's it's a just a data definition difference, um, but it, it's also um, speaking to people's experience because it, it, you know you can um, work a couple of hours and, and still receive those benefits, for example, which means that you wouldn't be counted as unemployed for survey purposes; you'd show up as underemployed, uh, which is still a significant problem. Tracy, um, I, I can suggest this, uh, write it down, Whiteford, Peter Whiteford, one of our authors, he uh, about a week ago produced what I think was the best uh, explanation of why the number on unemployment benefits is high. And he's had to work it out by going into the mm -hmm. figures and why the number unemployed, uh, you know, as measured in answer to surveys is low. The answer has a lot. Well, firstly, the thing is you can be on unemployment benefits and still be employed because they're income related, not uh, hours related. And you can be unemployed. In fact, most unemployed are not on unemployment benefits. Um, and uh, he, he goes through it. There's a number of changes to do with uh, COVID. We um, have mm -hmm. a question about the elephant in the room, the number one concern of uh, people in the conversation and ABC surveyed. Um, the economic aspects of climate change, particularly um, I guess, as they relate to prices. So, you know, we have this intergenerational report that looks out 40 years. Clim the, the, the climate change, um, well, climate change is upon us and a lot more is imminent. Uh, is that What effect is that likely to have on economic growth? Negative, I guess. Prices, I guess. Uh, you know, upward, I guess. Uh, uh, it's it's the big question. Um, <laughs> you first, John. Um, probably not not any impact on, the lo in, on inflation in the longer term because I think the Reserve Bank will still be uh, aiming yeah. to keep uh, inflation at, at between 2 and 3% on average. But if there are climate uh, forces pushing up prices, then that would mean they'd have to keep probably interest rates a bit higher in order to achieve that target. Yeah, I see what you mean. I I, I had this um, uh, years ago when the uh, Sydney Olympics were uh, about to be held. Um, uh, it was the Sydney Olympic Authority uh, produced a, a study showing, you know, it would boost the economy by this much and my my sort of response to them was, well, if it did, the Reserve Bank could adjust interest rates to make sure it didn't. <laughs> so I suppose I suppose that's that's one answer. Julie, what what can we say, if anything, broad brush, about the the effect of climate change and what we'll have to do as a result? Yeah, there's there's lots. Uh, it's such a huge question, isn't it? There's there's lots of estimates about what it might do to uh, aggregate growth. Um, but I think the, the bigger question is about how it changes the structure of our economy. So um, in the, the latest round of, of the inflation numbers, since that's the topic for 
today. Um, we did see the effects of, of floods and we've certainly seen the effects of the, the bushfires two years ago. They all showed up in the pricing data um, and in the avail actual availability of certain classes of, of product. Um, we're seeing it in commodity markets um, and in, you know, the, the shift in, in energy types and sources um, and starting to see that in transport in Australia. Um, I'm really curious to see whether the this huge increase we're seeing in, in petrol and diesel prices is in any way going to accelerate the, the move to electric vehicles. So, you know, there's so much else working against it in Australia. But, you know, how does it change the structure of the economy and, and the structure of our industries and our consumption? My, my concern another, about another that... Go on, John. Uh, climate change could have is to make inflation more um, volatile, more variable, because you'll have more extreme mm. weather events. And when you've got floods or bushfires or so on, that often leads to uh, jumps in the price of uh, foods. Correct. Mm. And and the price of insurance. And I believe there was a, a report released earlier this week by the Climate Change Council looking at the, the impact on insurance pricing um, going forward from here. So there, there's lots of different elements to this in addition to the effect it has on, on our own um, living conditions. We have a, a question from Radiance, I hope I said that right, Strathdee, um, about housing. Um, people talk about inflation, uh, but for very good reasons. Uh, one price rise isn't included, one, one category of, uh, 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 you know, I suppose the biggest price rise isn't included in the consumer price index because land is not regarded as a consumer item. Uh, the price of building houses is included in the index and the price of rent is included in the index, but not the price of land, uh, which was racing up. Uh, you know, the rate of $1,000 uh, a day uh, for a while in New South Wales. Um, it, it's, now, um, it's now stopped uh, for the moment, uh, perhaps in anticipation of uh, rate rises. What can we do to make housing more affordable? It, it's a bit ridiculous to talk about the cost of living as we're doing <laughs> without talking about the cost that people are, are, are most... Uh, complaining about. Are uh, you first, John? Okay. I mean, if you're talking about um, housing affordability, the people who are suffering most there are the, the homeless and the poor people in the private rental market. Mm. But what gets most of the discussion is sort of home purchase affordability. So can people afford to, to buy a, a home? And that's a very um, difficult thing to do something about because to make a serious improvement in um, home purchase affordability, you either need the price of homes to go down or the, at least for them to increase at a slower rate than they otherwise would. And because two thirds of the, the population own uh, homes, uh, you know, politicians are reluctant to do anything that uh, is, is going to make house prices uh, fall significantly. So it's, uh, it is a, a, a difficult problem to address. Shirley. Oh, just um, on the on the definition thing, it's worth clarifying that that um, as Peter said, the the CPI numbers that we look at do include rent, and they include the cost of buying a house. But it's a consumer index and not an asset price index, so it it does exclude um, existing home purchases um, because the main component there is is land, which which is an asset. Um, yeah, I agree completely with John that, that actually when we think about housing affordability, the, the policy focus really should be on those that can't afford to any sort of home. Um, and that, that group, uh, certainly in Melbourne, it feels like it's growing. It looks like it's growing. And, and that's a more significant social problem than people being able to afford to buy a home, although, um, you know, that, that's a concern as well. It, it is complex, though, and there's there's so many um, factors involved in home ownership rates, um, but the pricing's just really gotten out of hand and it's, um, it's a difficult one to put a lid on now that it's out of the box again. 
Final question from Avis Williamson. Um, should an incoming government control prices? We used to have price control. We've certainly had it at the state mm. level. I, New South Wales for years used to control the price of bread very effectively. Bakers still produce bread, sliced white loaves at the um, uh, required price and no more. They made their money on the sourdough and, uh, 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 and other things. South Australia had price controls for years. <laughs> Might the best way to control prices to you first, John, um, be to control prices by legislation or regulation? Yeah, I think I think the evidence is is moving to some sort of um, you know, controlled economy, a la the sort of former Soviet Union, is, is probably not uh, desirable on sort of. I'm not sure that New South Wales yeah. in the Rand years <laughs> or South Australia in the Dunstan years was um, Soviet Union, but continue. Mm -hmm. But if you only well, if you only control one or two uh, prices, that's not going to have much impact on on the total inflation rate. Uh, rate. And, and the problem tends to be if you keep the price too low, people just won't supply that good. Good. So the, the bakers will, will make croissants, but they won't make loaves of bread if they can't charge more than a certain price for a loaf yeah, no, of bread. And they use bread in New South Wales, as someone who was uh, regulating them told me, they use bread as the gateway drug or the, <laughs> or the loss leader, right? So they, they were sort of happy to, uh, because it was quite fair for them in the sense that they're all, they all price limited on those sliced white loaves. And uh, then they put their uh, more expensive offerings next to it. But but um, I, 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 I see, see uh, your point, Julie. Uh, look, I, I don't think inflation's got to the point where we need to look at that kind of thing. We're, we're only talking about a couple of quarters of high inflation at the moment. And remember, this is coming off a period where we had um, deflation. Prices fell in 2020. Um, and, and we have had a lot of disruption. A lot of what we're seeing, you know, particularly if I look through the, the groups, you know, the, the factors affecting food and grocery prices, the factors affecting construction, uh, they're all temporary. Um, so, so jumping to a, a really hard permanent um, measure like price fixing uh, really isn't necessary. John, uh, and I'll ask you to... to sort of uh, conclude uh, on this note, John, but we'll take that as your conclusion, Julie. Will this pass, um, as as Julie is suggesting? And I note that the um, Melbourne Institute's inflation gauge, this is something it does every month, the Bureau does something every quarter, showed that in April, uh, aggregate price increases, when uh, added up, uh, accounted to zero. So <laughs> we either had a pause for a month or uh, that there's a sign that, while some prices are rising, some are now also coming down. Do, do you see this as a as a, as a blip, or as uh, moving up to a new step? Well, uh, some of the things which have pushed prices up in the last year are not going to recur over the the next year. So, I think it's very unlikely that global oil prices will increase as much over the next year as they have over the past year. For example, they're, they're more likely to fall back if anything. Uh, similarly, some of the distortions due to um, the government measures to address COVID, they'll drop out of the out of the figures. Over time, some of the supply chain problems that have been, were caused by people being uh, confined to a, a local government area or a state or something, uh, they'll get sort of sorted out. So you, you, should, you should see quite a few of the things that have been pushing up price in the past year pass out of the system gradually over the over the next year. That's all we have time for. I hope that makes you feel better. Um, and I, I hope it comes to pass. The odd thing is we wanted a bit of inflation. The Reserve Bank felt the inflation was too low for so long. And uh, it's one of those cases of uh, uh, don't wish too hard. Um, all things in hope... moderation, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the governor, the poor governor of the Reserve Bank has been trying to do for nearly all of his term that began in 2016. He's had inflation lower than his target band, and now he's got it higher. So, uh, you know, maybe he can uh, he can fine-tune things a bit more. Um, keep reading the conversation and other news sources uh, for news about the cost of living. We know that uh, in a week's time, we'll have uh, news on wages uh, three days before the election on uh, Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday the 18th uh, 
the updated wages news comes out, which will be for the March quarter, so we can actually compare it with uh, the uh, fairly frightening uh, news on prices. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, John. If you want to read more from John Hawkins, look him up in the conversation. He's one of our most prolific authors, and uh, looking him up is uh, like an index of uh, a guide uh, to uh, sort of um, uh, explanations of the things that you might be most concerned about. If you want to read more from Julie Toth, I am thrilled that she is polled every six months in the Conversations Economic Survey each January and July. Now, these economists don't always get it right, uh, but at the risk of sharing data that I've shared with Julie and almost no one else um, in the decade or so that I've been doing this, um, her <laughs> Julie's predictions happen to have been uh, uh, the most accurate. So um, things are always a mixture of luck and skill, but uh, I, I would be, uh, if, if I were Julie, I'd be prepared to claim that. So uh, you, you can read her there and uh, otherwise she works for clients at uh, NAS Group. So thank you so much for joining us and um, thank you so much for taking part in the Conversations uh, survey. I think we learned a lot. Thank you.